thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back to talk to you about this topic that uh, too often goes ignored. And I give talks about this all over the world, including at Grand Rounds, and invariably at least half of the physicians don't know the difference between an embryonic and an adult stem cell, don't know that thousands of people every year being treated with adult stem cells for dozens of conditions. So we're going to go through a little bit of background first just to make sure everybody's up to speed and knows all these things. Talk about some of the current treatments that are available and how to even find out about some of those. And then I also want to give you a little flavor for the current regulatory environment out there. Now, I actually, a uh, little disclaimer here, I am from Kansas. And I actually just flew back from Kansas. There was a little problem. I was there doing some legislative testimony and got caught in a snowstorm. There's about 12 inches of snow on the ground. We're trying to clean off here just so that I can make it to the Applog conference. Yeah. Okay. Duty. So, uh, this paper came out a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, and it said you have about a 1 in 200 chance, any of us, in the U.S. of receiving a hematopoietic stem cell transplant during our lifetime. Now, most of the time in the past we have thought about these in terms of various types of leukemias, anemias, and so on, but the applications of, in particular, adult stem cell transplants are expanding rapidly. Almost every month there's some new paper on some new application that's coming out. Now let's talk about a little background though, of course, most people think of stem cells, they think of embryonic, and these are the kind of phrases, especially from the political class that we've heard. Uh, former Senator Specter, embryonic stem cells are a fountain of youth, and they have the potential to cure all known maladies. Now when I heard that, I thought, what about dandruff? Halitosis. Former Speaker of the House, Pelosi, science has taken us to a place that is biblical in its power to cure, and that's embryonic stem cell research. It's the answer to our prayers. Not exactly, maybe a little hyperbola. And even current NIS director, Francis Collins. This is important, life-saving research. Now, they're talking about embryonic stem cells here. And this is probably more truthful. St. Peter meeting all these little ones at the gate going, is this partial birth abortion? No, stem cell research. In particular, embryonic. There are millions of young lives that have been lost to this embryonic research as well. So let's just lay a little groundwork here. We're all starting as a single-celled embryo, your destiny from day one. And this is from a paper actually in the journal Nature a few years ago, one of the two leading scientific journals in the world. Most people think about stem cells and treatments like this, that you'll go into Stem Cell Depot to the parts department and ask for your part and model number. Hey, you got a femur for a 57 Caucasian, a heart for a 69 model, as if you're going to grow whole organs in the lab and then just swip, swap out parts. Now, there will be some applications like that, some organ transplant engineering, but that's not the usual way stem cells are or will be applied. Instead, you're going to get something more like this. Now, basically, any stem cell we talk about continues to grow and divide. That's what makes it a stem cell, and also the fact that it responds to differentiate or commit into specialized tissues. And there are lots of sources for stem cells, obviously not just embryonic. But we're talking about now applying these in this way, where after an infarct, not that whole organ is down, but part of that muscle is damaged or dead, and so we would be injecting stem cells, in this case from bone marrow, into the damaged part of the heart to regenerate, repair or replace that damaged tissue. Now, in terms of embryonic, it's interesting that even some of the leading practitioners have admitted it's probably not going to treat patients or not treat them anytime soon. Dr. James Thompson from University of Wisconsin-Madison is Mr. Human Embryonic Stem Cell. He was the one who first successfully grew human embryonic stem cells in the lab in 1998. This is from a 2007 interview where he said, well, there are some obstacles like learning how to grow the cells into the types of organs and tissue you need, <laughs> making sure cancer and other defects are not introduced, and he thought it was decades away. This was 2007. In another interview he said, scientists have overestimated the prospects 
for transplantation cures using embryonic stem cells. So what was he doing in his lab? Not working on cures or treatments, but working on drug discovery and testing. And in point of fact, he recently switched his laboratory away from embryonic stem cells to a non-embryonic type of cell. This is the guy that started the field, and in the New York Times, he was quoted as saying, it's great to be in on both the beginning and the end of an area of research. So why are some people still so fixated on embryonic stem cells? Like Kevin Egg at Harvard said it best, states will pour more money into this research and we'll all get more money. There is, unfortunately, a very real economic aspect to this, a draw for people who want to do research, they want the money. So, what about the actual clinical applications of human embryonic stem cells? We could pretty much just go on from here because there are none. There's been a few clinical trials. The first actually approved, I'm sure, uh, just coincidentally, a few days after President Obama was inaugurated. A company named Geron received FDA approval to start injecting embryonic stem cell derivatives into a few patients who had spinal cord injury. It had to be within a few days because they already knew from the rat experiments the cells wouldn't even work in the rats after a few days of an injury. So they got approval, this was January of 2009, then they were put back on a safety hold. And it wasn't until 2010, the fall of 2010, that they were given approval and actually started injecting, but this was the result that they got. Their stock price went way up. As far as the patients, Within a year of starting that trial, and a total of five patients injected, they discontinued not only the trial, but all of their embryonic stem cell research. And they're in the process of trying to sell off all those assets. They actually canned about a third of their research force. There's another company called Advanced Cell Technology, ACT, that is running two trials in the U.S. with embryonic stem cells for various visual problems, including macular degeneration. They've injected about a dozen patients so far, but this paper came out in Lancet four months after the first injection. Way too early really to tell whether there were any positive effects and certainly to tell whether there were any safety problems from tumors. And in fact, they admitted there were problems. One reviewer just said to reach any conclusion on the safety or efficacy of two patients treated for four months without a control for comparison is unreasonable. That's why anecdotal reports like this are not public. It falsely raises the hopes of millions. And in fact, one of the patients in the paper, if you read through it, says, well, the eye that was injected improved and the eye that wasn't injected improved. Can you say placebo? And later on, in a response letter in Lancet, the authors admitted at no point in our paper do we claim evidence of a therapeutic response. And they really backpedaled and, and downplayed it all. Now, those trials are still going on, and so we'll just have to see what happens. But embryonic stem cells being used clinically, the answer is no. What about other sources? Well, it's interesting, and here's Dolly's data. Ian Willink was the cloner of Dolly the Sheep. And he's been saying, look, we need to give up on cloning and embryonic stem cells because there's this other stuff out there that we need to be doing. California in 2004 passed Prop 71, which put three billion, that's with a B, state taxpayer dollars towards embryonic stem cell research and cloning. They spent a lot of their money over a period of time and realized they're not getting any results and the clock is ticking and the money's running out and they've got nothing to show for it. So what are they starting to find? More and more adult stem cell research so they can actually show some results with patients. So you can, you can get embryonic stem cells from normal embryos made by fertilization. I briefly want to talk about cloning. So here's one view of cloning. <laughs> this is the science fiction view. You're not going to walk down the street and meet your clone. Instead, you have to start with an embryo. So you can make embryos the old-fashioned way, or you can make it via cloning. The fancy term, if you're not familiar with it, is somatic cell nuclear transfer, where you transfer the nucleus of a body cell into an egg that's been enucleated. You get an embryo. 
You can also get a similar type of embryo through parthenogenetic activation. Human oocytes keep chromosomes until the sperm arrives. So you can actually trick it chemically to make it think it's been fertilized. It'll keep those, it'll start developing, and it'll get at least up to the blastocyst point. But they're still embryonic stem cells, and they still have really no safe application in any human being. Dolly the sheep was made by this cloning technique. Uh, take the chromosomes out of a sheep egg, transfer the nucleus from a body cell, you get a single cell cloned embryo. After a while, if you transplant that into the womb of a surrogate mother, hello Dolly. Some people call this reproductive cloning or after a live born clone, or they may talk about therapeutic cloning. Now, it sounds good, but all you did was kill that embryo and put the cells into the dish in hopes of some sort of experiment. There's nothing therapeutic about it for the embryo. The embryo dies, and there are no therapies. But there's still a market for eggs. And this was an advertisement that actually appeared in a local paper in the D.C. area a few years ago, which comes first, the egg or the cure. And they're soliciting young women to come risk their health, their very life in some cases, to donate their eggs, sometimes for compensation, for various experiments. And it sounds great. You could be on treatment of diabetes and heart disease, and you list all of the sorry conditions to induce these young women to come in and super ovulate to get all these eggs. A friend of mine put this film out called Exploitation. And it sounds funny until you get into the real cases where a number of women have died and 10 to 20% experience some sort of condition or problem that involves hospitalization. It's not a safe technique. So if you can't get enough women's eggs, what about animal eggs? Well, it turns out Brave New Britain, you can actually get a license to clone using animal eggs with human DNA. Cow eggs, pig eggs, rabbit eggs, there are three groups that have actually gotten a license to make clones this way. They can be combined uh, cow egg with human DNA and get a cowboy. <laughs> it turns out, of course, even though they got this pushed through the parliament, got approval, got the licenses, nothing's come up. The other thing they're working on now are three parent embryos. And I don't know if that's uh, what Dr. Helke was referring to earlier, but the idea that you can potentially treat mitochondrial diseases by doing what amounts to a cloning at the embryonic stage with two different eggs and the sperm and recombining into a three parent sort of embryo, something else that they're thinking about now. Well, in terms of the ethics, I think this slide pretty much says that the guy on the left, I died waiting for embryonic stem cell research to find a cure. What about you? The guy on the right, I was the embryo. The other problem with this is not just the ethical problem of destroying some young human beings for the potential, and that's all it is, potential benefit of others. The problem is it doesn't mention that there are alternatives to embryonic stem cells. Most people have only heard about embryonic because most of the media just talk about stem cell, and there's no adjective there. Well, again, a few years ago, uh, Ian Wilmot said, you know, I'm, I have a license to actually make human clones in the UK. I'm giving that license back. This Japanese scientist came up with this new way to do things. This was back in 2007. And then these titles started to show up in the news, human embryonic stem cells without an embryo. Scientists bypass the need for an embryo and so on. Well, what had happened was Shinya Yamanaka in Japan came up with a process called induced pluripotent stem cells, where you take a normal cell, not a stem cell, just any cell, and you add a few genes, sometimes with or without some chemical help, and you essentially reprogram that cell, like a skin cell, to look and act like an embryonic stem cell, but there are no embryos at all, no eggs, none of the cloning technology. You simply are changing the gene expression so the cell behaves like an embryonic stem cell. In fact, it's easier and cheaper than getting embryonic stem cells. It's obviously ethical in the sense you don't have to kill anybody to get those cells. You can make them from virtually anybody. 
You can make them for people that have different diseases and steady disease progression in the lab, or try and come up with drug testing and various things. And this is actually what Jamie Thompson, Mr. Human Embryonic Stem Cell, switched to. Instead of embryonic stem cells, he is using these IPS, or induced stem cells now. Dr. Yamanaka was asked by the New York Times, why did you come up with this? And his answer is revealing. He said, I went to a colleague's lab, looked through the microscope at a, an embryo, and he said, when I saw the embryo, I suddenly realized there was such a small difference between it and my daughter's. And I thought, we can't keep destroying embryos for a reason. There must be another way. And he just won the Nobel Prize this past fall for this research. I want to mention just briefly another way to get tissue repair or new cells is called direct reprogramming. Now what Yamanaka did is you take an ordinary cell like a skin cell, you add the genes and you back it up to a very early stem cell state. And then you would have to re-differentiate it into any of the various tissues you wanted to use. Direct reprogramming just kind of Go straight to jail without passing go, if you're familiar with the Monopoly game. You take the cell, a normal differentiated cell. You do add some genes, but you don't change it into a stem cell and then back into something else. You just go straight across. And they've used it, in fact, this past year, about a dozen papers, just in the past year, of changing things like one nerve cell type into another, or even a skin cell into a nerve cell, or a skin cell into a heart cell. So there are lots of potential applications here that totally bypass, again, any embryonic death. Now let's talk about adult stem cells because this is where the real patient treatments are. This is what we've usually heard back at the embryonic stem cell flight school. You can either tempt fate in one of these death traps or I'll show you the future of aviation. And it's kind of what we've heard for years, that embryonic stem cell had such a future, but adult stem cells, for decades, have actually been treating patients, thousands of patients. When the NIH reviewed the science back in 2001, they had to admit it wasn't until recently anyone seriously considered the possibility stem cells in adult tissues could make specialized cell types of another type. It's like they're scratching their head going, oh, I wish I'd thought of that one. We're looking at a new paradigm in biology. <laughs> Moving quickly along. <laughs> okay, so as a grad student, I was taught there are only a couple of stem cells in your body that are defined, that are hard to get out. You can't make them do anything. You can't make them grow. You can't make other kinds of tissues from them. Old science, very old science. In red are some of the tissues, not all, but some of the tissues where we now know you can get adult stem cells in black some of the products, some of the specialized cells we know they can become. It may not be a large percentage, but we know that the adult stem cells can actually make these transformations into other cell types. Bone marrow transplants have been done for decades, but it wasn't until the 90s they isolated the first adult stem cell from bone marrow and said, okay, this is the active ingredient. And now they're finding them in peripheral blood, it's the muscle, the brain, Umbilical cord blood is a rich source, even liposuction fat. Now, if we needed an unlimited supply of stem cells, <laughs> we're pretty well off as a nation, you've got to admit. <laughs> but they're useful, and they're being used now, right now, in over 60,000 patients a year <coughs> around the globe. Let me repeat that, over 60,000 patients a year around the world get adult stem cell transplants. Most of it's bone marrow, but some from some of these other sources now, a growing amount from umbilical cord blood, and they're treating dozens of different conditions. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, and I've got a little search parameter, I'm looking for adult stem cells, they're actually interventional, you're not just watching things, you're trying to actually intervene in a disease. This was from a few days ago, there are over 2,600 FDA approved clinical trials, either ongoing or finished, just within this database. Now, the bad part is they don't have a little thing that says, okay, sometime when they come up with uh, another trial for heart damage, you know, let me know, or anything like that. So you have to physically go in and look for these. We're hoping to change that soon. 
There are various folks, various practitioners, though, like Richard Bird at Northwestern, who are using these adult stem cells to treat lots of different conditions. Richard used to be a hemoc guy, treating leukemias. He said, why can't we do the same thing for autoimmune diseases? And so he's treated multiple sclerosis. Here are a few of the papers that they've done. They've done juvenile diabetes. There are over two dozen patients who've been off their insulin, in some cases, eight years now. They've used umbilical cord blood and bone marrow for sickle cell anemia. I, I didn't exhaust all of, all of Richard's things. There are probably a dozen or more autoimmune diseases he alone is using to try and treat. Sickle cell anemia, it's interesting because in a number of references, they now use the C word, curative, to treat sickle cell anemia. In this case, uh, this is the Davis family. Little Joe Jr. here had severe sickle cell. His parents, when he was six months old, were told he's not going to live to be a teenager. Uh, about a year later, along came little brother Isaac. Perfect umbilical cord blood match. And Joe Jr. no longer has sickle cell anemia. Parkinson's disease. There's one published case, with Dennis Turner shown here, but a clinical trial involved uh, by a company where they're starting to use the patient's own neural stem cells to try and alleviate symptoms of Parkinson's. And there's another trial by a group called Brainstorm out of Israel, and they hope to be actually starting that one in the U.S. soon. Uh, spinal cord injury. I mean, we hear all of this about embryonic. People are going to jump out of their wheelchairs and walk again. Well, not with embryonic, and maybe not jumping and running marathons, but with adult stem cells, patients are walking again. They are showing, feeling again. They're recovering bladder function. Silvio Vlagnani is just one example. Quadriplegic, two years after his injury, had some of his own nasal adult stem cells transplanted into the lesion. Remember, he was quadriplegic. He's standing. He can walk about 30 feet. He can wave with his arms and so on. That's with his nasal adult stem cells. He gets up your nose a whole new meaning for stem cells. <laughs> stroke. Sean Savitz in Houston has been treating a bunch of stroke patients. Now he's got at least two or more clinical trials going. Uh, Roland Hendricks was the first patient he treated. He wanted to get the patients in and within about three days treat them. Now they're out to 19 days after the stroke event. Keep pushing it back farther and farther. Remember I said in most cases you won't grow a whole new organ. Well, this is an exception to that rule. Caitlin had a whole new bladder grown in the lab for her own adult stem cells, functional bladder. She's in a group of patients that uh, experienced that. Claudio Castillo needed a new trachea. She was in Spain. Uh, she was about to lose a lung because of tuberculosis. And they said, well, let's grow her a new trachea. And they used cadaveric tissue, stripped all the cells off. Since she just basted it with her own adult stem cells from bone marrow, after a few days got this, which they transplanted back in. And a week later, she walked out of the hospital. And now they've advanced, they've treated a number of patients, but they've also developed, instead of waiting for cadaveric tissue, they've developed a synthetic substrate where they can add your bone marrow adult stem cells to that, grow the trachea, transplant it in. Uh, limbal stem cell therapy for corneal transplants, and uh, as you can clearly see, I just love to say that with that slide, but you do see this nice clear cornea regrown from the patient's own adult stem cells. In one case, chemical burns, you know, these are surface, but one patient had been blind for 50 years and now could see again. Uh, peripheral artery disease, where they're losing circulatory uh, circulation in the limb, facing an amputation. Helen Thomas was faced with that. They just used some of her own bone marrow adult stem cells, injected into the limb to start regrowing vessels, and she and her hubby are out dancing now. Heart damage. This is uh, the number one killer, of course, in the U.S. and a lot of countries. In Germany, for over 10 years, 
they have used the patient's own bone marrow adult stem cells to treat infarct damage. Very similar to that little cartoon I showed earlier on. In fact, in Germany now, in some places, it's considered standard treatment to do this. It's no longer experimental. Still experimental here, but a lot of studies are going on all over the states to try and bring this uh, to phase two and phase three studies. Genetic conditions. So epidermolysis bullosa, named Liao, little guy. And if you're not familiar with this condition, you can't hug these patients because their skin just sloughs off. Well, what they did was donor. It's genetic again, so you can't use your own. Donor adult stem cells from bone marrow and cord blood and inject it into these patients, and they started to regrow new skin. And you could verify, of course, it's derived from the injected cells. And this one starts to get more science fiction but the skin gun. They've actually shown you can take some of your own adult stem cells from bone marrow from skin and spray it on. Gerlach in Pittsburgh, essentially like a paint spray gun almost. Now, it doesn't mean you immediately get a layer of skin, but it does hasten the healing, provides a nice sterile covering instead of waiting weeks for skin grafts to grow in the lab and then transplant them on. And growing new heart vessels and bits and pieces and so on. So little Angela Irizarry uh, had a condition where they needed to essentially grow a new part for her heart and a new vessel. So they did it. Now, the scoreboard is outdated at this point, and it's actually hard to keep up. If you looked at published peer-reviewed papers, we're probably somewhere around 80 or more already for adults themselves in Zippo for embryonic. But patients and physicians need to be aware. Because if you just Google stem cell transplant, you'll get thousands of hits on the internet. And it will be from some places that, let's say, are less than reputable. There is no place, in fact, where you can go as a database and say, hey, this is a recognized place, a good, valid treatment. International Cell Medicine Society has tried to put this together, but really are not at a point where there's any one place you can go and find you know, where to refer your patients or where to maybe go learn how to do some of these transplants yourself. The FDA has actually clamped down on some doctors who wanted to do this as part of their medical practice, saying, hey, you don't have an IND, you haven't filed all the paperwork, you can't do this. And they've challenged companies. One company is actually just moving outside the U.S. so they can continue to grow the cells and treat the patients. In the U.S., the regulatory environment as far as stem cells and embryo research is very thin. Really, the only federal <coughs> regulation or law is what's called the Dickey Wicker Amendment. And it's simply about funding. Ever since 1996, every year Congress puts this on it, basically just says you can't use federal taxpayer funds to kill an embryo or to create embryos for research, no matter how you create them, including cloning and some of the other things. But that's it. Some states have worked on putting things together, but then you start to see these differing legislative definitions show in these various bills. And someone will say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ban cloning. This bill is to ban cloning. What well, might actually be to ban cloning, which is what the first definition, the, the science one at the top is, it's from a bill that Senator Brownback, when he was senator, wrote up a few years ago. It would have completely prevented someone from making human clones in the laboratory. But then you can get ones that just say, well, you can make them, you just can't transfer them to the womb, or you just can't let them be born. And actually, that last definition, which would allow a clone to be created and gestated up to the point of birth, is now law in the state of New Jersey. Other countries are ahead of us in terms of a lot of our regulation of stem cells and cloning and embryo research. So in terms of cloning itself, you know, we hear so often, oh, it's just you religious zealot conservatives. Well, religious zealot conservative France Seven years in jail if you clone. Canada, five. Germany, five. A bunch of other countries. Even that bastion of conservatism, the United Nations, in 2005, essentially said you can't do human cloning. Court of Justice in the European Union recently ruled that, yes, that thing is a human embryo, and you cannot use it to make patentable products. You can't essentially 
instrumentalize a human embryo. In the U.S., uh, Bush, when he was president, put in this executive order related to stem cells, basically following the Dickey Wicker language that you can't use federal funds to kill embryos, but here we've got a bunch of cells in the dish. You can use federal funds for that. As soon as President Obama came in within a couple of months, actually March 9th of uh, 2009, he threw that all out. It was kind of wide open. NIH came up with some guidelines, and the guidelines are you kill them, we don't care how or how you pay for it, just not with federal funds. Bring us the dish of cells, and we'll include you in the federal trough. Uh, here is the, all the signing, all the clapping, all of the, of course, we're going to cure all the maladies going on. They've now categorized 200 different embryonic stem cell lines at NIH, but you know, most scientists are actually starting to use those induced stem cells and adult stem cells now. Switching, just like California, because, hey, they'd actually like to see some results. Dr. James Shirley and Dr. Teresa Deicher actually sued HHS and Secretary Sebelius and NIH and Director Collins in the summer of 2009. The lawsuit went on for a long time and briefly they actually shut down federal taxpayer funding for about two weeks and then the appeals court threw it out and went back and forth. Recently they had filed a cert petition to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided just didn't want to hear it. So the judicial path has been shut down at this point in time at least. But there's still legislative paths to try and get good policy, life-affirming policy in. And that's out in the states. There are a lot of states where some good policies have already been put in place. I'm just showing here a number of them related to stem cells and bioethics and embryos. But uh, there are a lot of good things related to prohibiting abortion. A number of states uh, I've already been in this year, over the last month and a half, where they're trying to move things ahead, or states that are trying to put good positive things in. And in fact, in Kansas, you know, it's just there what they're trying to do is start an adult stem cell treatment center and pour their money into actually getting more therapies and more treatments to patients and then educate people, including, hey, let's put together a database where Physicians and patients could look up and see what is really available out there for adult stem cell treatments. Uh, in the center, a little curly-haired guy is Governor Brownback for Kansas. So he's been one of the ones that's pushing it, meeting with a bunch of doctors trying to move this ahead. You need to get involved in the fight, too. You need to, be, to not be the winner of the Not My Job Award. There are lots of ways that you can be involved in trying to get life-affirming policies out there and protect all human life. And so let me just encourage you to do that, to step forward, to step in the gap, to speak up for those who don't have a voice. One of the things we've done at Family Research Council lately is start a project called Adult Stem Cells Save My Life Education Awareness Campaign. It's a website stemcellresearchfacts.org, where we have just put up little patient videos to try and educate patients, physicians, anybody who wants to know what's really working with adult stem cells. Take a look at it, look at the videos, and pass it on. Thank you very much. Two, time for two questions. Dennis. Uh, two quick questions. Number one, why did Geron Corp abandon their work after five patients? And then number two, is there has been has there been any documented difference in pluripotency between IPS cells and embryonic stem cells? Uh, why did Geron quit? And that was the company that was doing the embryonic stem cell injections into spinal cord patients. Why did they quit after a year and five patients? Their stated reason was they didn't have enough money to do that clinical trial and the other things that they wanted to do, which were primarily some, some new chemotherapeutic drugs. Uh, I doubt that's the real reason, since they had a quarter billion dollars in the bank, including some from California, embryonic stem cell, and so on. They did admit very quietly that none of the patients had shown any improvement whatsoever. 
And one thought is they wanted to get out while the getting was good. Uh, the other half of the question, sorry, what was it? Is there any, any document? Oh, the pluripotency, documented differences, pluripotency between embryonic and the induced pluripotent stem cells. There seem to be some small differences. Uh, for example, newly made iPS cells seem to reflect in some regard the tissue they came from, whether it was blood, bone, muscle, and so on, though it's been shown that you continue to culture them for another month while that goes away. So there's, there's little to no difference, and it's probably not significant in terms of any use. One more quick question. Yeah. Do they have any trouble with uh, tumor genesis that the embryonic stem cells have? The induced, did, did the induced yeah. uh, pluripotent stem cells have the trouble with tumor genesis that embryonic do? Yes, in fact, that's how they know they're pluripotent. Put them into the, the new mouse, and if you get a tumor, you celebrate. So they're probably not going to be a real good clinical usage. There was a mention, in fact, in the last week that they were moving, had a clinical trial approved in Japan. They actually don't have it approved. They're probably at least a year away. They think they can control it, just like the guys thought they could control embryonic. Their forte is going to be lab tests, drug testing, you know, modeling in the lab. Adult stem cells are going to be the ones treating the patients. Thank you all for your time.